Hey guys, welcome to my channel. Today I thought I'd do a simple paint to sigh frequently asked questions video because I feel that despite the amount of tutorials out there, a lot of them seem to leave out most of the basic tools that make drawing just a little bit easier. So I've gathered a few questions that myself and a few of my art friends have had since we've started drawing digitally that we've sort of had to find out on our own. Please bear with me as I am horrible at explaining things, but I will for this video try my best to explain things thoroughly and in as much detail as I can, so hopefully it's not as bad as I'm expecting it to be. So for this question, as a beginner artist, I had struggled a lot with it because I could never find an artist who gave a straight answer to this question. And obviously different artists have different preferences and they use different sizes and just things that they feel more comfortable using. When I had first started out, I found an artist who used 5000 by 5000 pixel canvas. Now this would be great if you're a simple artist and you draw very simple characters, but if you're one of those artists who has a lot of detail and uses a lot of layers in their drawing, then this will definitely not be the best size option. I started using this and it used to crash sigh all the time and I could not save my drawings and it was just too much for sigh to handle. So my size preference would be 3000 by 3000 pixels with a 300 pixel resolution. This would be great for all kinds of drawings, it will not crash sigh and will definitely give you a great resolution for the finished product. So I feel this question is one that a lot of beginner artists will always have because I feel like when people go into digital art they go in thinking that oh I just press save and the drawing will save and it will be a normal picture. But no, I struggled with this when I first started doing digital art because I had no idea of any kind of picture format, PNG or JPEG, I had no idea about that and I thought it was basically click save and it saves. But no. So how you save a drawing is you go up to file and you click save as or you can click on export as. So after you click save as, you can then select one of the formats. I recommend a PNG because it has the highest quality and resolution compared to a JPEG, but you can also select JPEG if you like, or that's just a personal preference. So for this question, I used to see this a lot with people's speed paints and I had no idea what it was. And it was very confusing because I thought that it was some kind of downloadable um, option on the side, but it's actually not, it's right here. So if you go to view, and click new you may not have noticed anything happen but if you click this button here it'll minimize all your windows and you'll have yourself a second window of your drawing so it looks like a second or just a duplicate but <clears throat> this is great because it helps you see exactly what you're doing so for an example if I draw on this one it'll show up on this one And this really helps because if you're one of those artists who likes to zoom in on like really small details and then after you zoom out you're like what the hell just happened um, this helps you really see what the hell you're doing and you won't end up with the what the heck kind of result when you zoom out So for this question, I also really struggled with when I first started drawing because I saw a lot of sweet paints so I never really understood what was happening. So I just see the line art being colored all of a sudden I had no idea what the heck they just did. So this one is very simple and it's literally a click of a button and if you don't know what preserve opacity is, um, I don't know what it means but I know what it does and basically preserve opacity, which is right here helps you or allows you to um, color line art or basically anything that is on the layer. So if you go to whichever layer you want to color, so here's my line art layer and I do the preserve opacity, then I can go ahead and color my line art. This also works for if you have any layers that are just for shading or coloring. You can also do that when you select the area 
preserve opacity and then you could shade on it and it won't go anywhere. So if you don't want to have to manually color it with a brush, you can press Ctrl F and it just fills in all of the line art for you. So for this one, honestly, I just figured out what it does very recently, so I'm <laughs> no expert on it. But basically how pinned layers work is they allow you to move two or, or more layers at the same time. So they kind of work like a folder layer where a folder lets you move all the layers inside of it together, but instead the pin layer lets you select which layers you want to move together. So all you have to do is have two layers of course, and whichever layer you select, you can click on the other layers you want right here, and it makes like a little pin thingy. And that just means that both of the layers are going to be moving together. So you press Ctrl T, which is transform, and you can just move the layers all together at the same time without having to manually go back to each and move it along with it. So basically, folders serve no significant purpose in the art making process other than to keep your layer section clean and uncluttered but other than that, they can also be used like a pin layer so that instead they can move all the contents within them at the same time. So if I click here on the folder and you can tell that these layers are inside of it and I press Ctrl T, I can move everything together. So this can be used or you can use pinning layers if you want to select a few specific layers instead of the whole folder. So mass layers usually serve different purposes depending on the artist and their style and different artists use them in different ways. So the main way that I use them is just so that I can clip everything onto them in one folder without having to create clipping groups and all that. So I'll just show you instead because I'm very bad at explaining things. So if I create a folder here and a layer inside of it and then I get my selection wand and I select just this cat here because I only want the cat. And then I click on the folder and up here is the layer mask. So if I click that, it'll do this little thing here which means it's been masked. So then if I go to the layer inside that folder and I fill it in with any color, so Control F to fill it'll just fill whatever has been selected and masked. So after that, I can create whatever layer I create in that folder. It means that it'll only be coloring whatever is being masked. So I often select different parts and just color those and keep a layer for them each and shade on that layer. But of course, this can be used in different ways and it doesn't have to be used just for that. So clipping groups are very similar to masked layers in the sense that whatever layer is clipped to your working layer is now bound to that layer, but it doesn't directly affect your working layer. So you can do whatever you want to that layer and it's still its own layer. So for example, if I fill in this selection on this layer and create a second layer directly above that working layer and set it to clipping group right here. This means that that layer is now directly bound to my filled in layer. But I can also go back and delete it whenever I want and it won't delete the rest of the layers. So through this you can basically add different modes like luminosity and multiply and such and it won't really make a difference to your working layer. And a lot of artists actually use clipping groups a lot more often than mass layers because they're very simple and straight to the point but I just personally prefer masked layers. So most art programs will have a stabilizer 
and it kind of speaks for itself when you really test it out. Um, the higher you go with the number, the smoother it kind of becomes, and the lower you go, the rougher and less smooth it becomes. So often zero stabilizer is used for making like little dots because it just gives you a lot more control as to what you're clicking. Um, whereas 15 is the average and probably best suited stabilizer for like drawing and just regular line art and most artists use it as their primary stabilizer. You can tell that with 15 when you try to make dots it kind of does like a little flick so that's why the lower you go the better the dots become. So that's just a small tip. For anyone who has trouble making dots with the stabilizer on 15. So I feel like this is a very big thing that most artists using Psy struggle with because most artists assume that for a drawing program it's gonna immediately have every possible option like shapes and such. And it's strange because Psy does have a line art layer which allows you to draw lines and curved lines but it just somehow does not have a circle option. So you kind of have to do this yourself. And artists were very smart and developed this really great idea and way to create circles without having to use an option or draw them themselves. So all you have to do is click here to create a line art layer which gives you these cool options and you're gonna have to move away from your drawing pen because you won't have a lot of steadiness with the pen and move to your mouse. So you have to click this option, the curve option here and click in one spot and hold it there and then on your keyboard click delete and immediately it'll start making curved lines every time you click it. So delete, click, delete, click, all the way until you finish the circle. And this can be very annoying because if you mess up, you have to start again. And I always mess up because I get too into it. And then when you're done, press enter and there is a perfect circle. So, a raster layer is basically when you have like a odd kind of layer type here, like the line art, the line work layer. You can go to layer and when you no longer want it to be a line work layer and you just want to make it a regular layer, you can click a rasterize line work layer and it becomes a normal layer. So with selections, there comes a few other options and they're pretty confusing sometimes. But the first question would be how do you select? Or what does the selection wand do? So to select, you can go to this little option here, which allows you to select whatever you want manually. So this is it. Or the selection wand, which allows you to select in bigger portions all at once. So with the selection one there's a few other options here which can be kind of confusing but basically what this little bar here does is it just kind of like determines how far the selection is gonna go whether it's gonna get into all the little like corners of your line work or not. So the higher it is obviously the further it's gonna go so that's why I keep it on zero because sometimes if you have like thinner areas of line art it will still go through it so it just means that you have to have really thick line art so I think it's just better to keep it on zero like it'll still select a pretty decent amount of space and you can always just go in and manually fix everything up yourself so what is increment? So increment basically means to make something bigger. So if you have a selection, like I've selected my cat, 
and you want to have a bigger selection or you want it to go kind of over the line work that you've selected and you go up here you can click increment and if you can see it it's getting kind of bigger the selection is getting quite big so the more times you click it the bigger it gets and that means that when you fill it you can tell that it's gone quite over the lines here and it's not very good it's pretty pixelated and this is just what often happens when you increment and that's basically what increment does it just makes the selection bigger now what does invert mean invert basically means when you flip something inside out so you have an invert option right here and also if you go up here there's invert so it means that whatever you selected if you click invert it will just select everything that was not selected before so this is what it does now for transforming and deforming a selected object so if I go to my line work layer here and I click Control T on my keyboard which pretty much means transform um, I'll have a few options here which allows me to do different kind of things to whatever I've selected so transform just means you know resizing it making it thinner whatever um, a common question with this is how do I resize my selection without deforming it or making it weirdly shaped to the original so for this all you have to do is select it hold shift on your keyboard and drag it up from the corner and it won't change the original size it will stay the same way and just either get bigger or smaller so here you have scale or free deform or rotate so I'm not sure what scale does but I know what free deform does and it means that you can kind of go a little bit further than the transform option with it so you can create kind of perspective and stuff like that I usually use this for when I have like a kind of weird angle that I'm trying to get at and I don't know how to draw it in that angle so I just draw a normal a normal perspective thing and then I'll transform it to be in the angle that I want it to be so with the selection one there is also a few options here that lets you change whatever your target of selection is so the first one is working later which basically means that your target for the selection wand will be whatever layer you're wa working on so if I'm working on this layer then my selection will only be on that the second one would be my favorite which I use all the time and that would be selection source so this is good because it lets you select exactly what you want to be selecting from or whichever layers you want to be selecting from so often what I do is I have I'll have my line art folder and I'll set that as my selection source up here and that will now mean that whatever is in that folder is going to be what I'm going to be selecting from so it won't interfere with anything else from other folders or other layers outside of the folder so the next one is all image which basically means that the selection target will be everything and every layer that's on your canvas so if I have my sketch layer here it'll also kind of go and work around the sketch layer so these are really good to keep in mind and use as you're working because they make selecting so much easier and they're just super helpful so honestly with this question I had no idea about what it did until my friend mentioned it to me so I thought it really made no difference to the brush settings but it kind of really does so what this option does when you go here you'll see that it says minimum size and I've always either had it set to 0 or to 50% so what this brush size does is it kind of affects in a way the pressure of the brush 
and allows it to have like a minimum. So if I have it set to 100 and I try to click really lightly with my pen, it will not allow me to do small strokes. It'll just fit the brush size or width. Whereas if I have it set to like 50% or any other percentage, it'll have that percentage no matter how hard or light I hold down on the pen. So that's why I always keep it at zero because no matter how big the circle is for the pen, I can still go really tiny with my details without having to constantly zoom in and color. So for these two, I kind of had to figure them out on my own and from other people that I asked. And they're kind of hidden almost. If you don't seem to play around with Sai a lot, you won't ever notice them probably. But if you click here on this little option called Paints Effect, it'll give you a drop down menu of all these other options that you would never have noticed. And the first one is Texture. So Texture means that if you color something or you have a filled layer and you click on one of the textures it gives you a like texture and this can be used for like if you want to draw a pattern or, or something on clothing and you don't have to draw the patterns yourself you can just select one of these textures and it gives you some really nice textures <laughs> so next is the fringe effect which is right below the textures and if you click here on the drop down menu fringe you can already tell that it created a kind of outline around the area that i've already colored so you can either make this outline thinner or thicker or you can make it more opaque or darker and this is often used with cell shaders i've noticed is that they like to add to their shading and it kind of makes the shading look a lot nicer and less Plain. and I personally only use this rarely but it's a really great option to use if you just want to spice up your drawings so this is a swatch pad and what it does is it lets you save colors that you selected and just put them into the little swatches so that you can use them another time and here is the scratch pad which almost kind of works like a mini canvas that you can test colors on, test um, different brush strokes on or like different textures. So it's just like a little mini tester pad, so hence the name scratch pad. So how do you get these two? You go to window and you can select swatches for the swatch pad or scratch pad for the scratch pad. <laughs> So how the swatches work is when you've got a color here, you hover over one of the swatches and you hold shift on your keyboard and click onto the swatch and it'll just appear there. Now if you want to move it because you decide you want to put a color in between or something, then you can hold control while you click on the swatch and just drag it around to the place that you want to keep it. Now if you want to delete a color because you decided you don't like it or you just want to move it and make some space, you can right click on the swatch with your mouse and click remove. So with most art programs, they offer a selection of brushes and um, they also seem to offer a bunch of settings to those brushes which lets you customize and modify the brushes to suit your preferences and your art style. So here you'll have different options like density, quality of the brush, the edge hardness, and textures. And this is great because it just means that everyone can have their own unique brushes. So if you right click on any of these empty spaces, they give you a variety of brushes that you can choose from. And then after you create a brush, you can then modify it under here in these little options. And if you want to rename the brush, you can double click on the brush and it will give you this little pop-up screen here. 
and it allows you to add a description and a name and you can also modify its stabilizer so it has a specific stabilizer for it and you can add a shortcut key. So this helps because it gives an artist a little bit of their own personal touch to their brushes and it's just really cool. So those are all the questions that I could think of and hopefully I answered any of the questions that you've been pondering or unable to find or get an answer to and hopefully my explaining wasn't that terrible and thank you all so much for watching i really appreciate you taking time out of your day to watch this long ass video and please like and comment if you enjoyed this video if you found anything helpful and you learned something new today hopefully and don't forget to subscribe if you're not already and i'll see you all in the next one bye